Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting jewishinsider.com. This AJC Advocacy Anywhere program falls on Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. In June 1967, at the close of the Six-Day War, Israeli paratroopers reached the Western Wall, symbolically completing the work of reuniting Jerusalem. No one tells that story better or writes more movingly about the Jewish connection to Jerusalem than today's guest and friend of AJC, Yossi Klein Halevi renowned author and commentator on Jewish and Israeli affairs. Yossi will be in conversation with Myra Clark Siegel, Director of Communications and Senior Strategic Counsel for AJC's Project Interchange. After we hear from Yossi and Myra, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or use the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. Myra, you have the floor. Thank you, Jillian. Yossi, first I want to thank you and welcome you to our AJC Advocacy Anywhere conversation. Um, proud to count you as a friend, both uh, personal and within all of AJC, and certainly within uh, the AJC Project Interchange delegations that you brief frequently and for many years now. Um, so I want to really thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Myra. And it's, it's always, always a joy to be with AJC. And really thank you all for the extraordinary work that you do. So Yossi, today is uh, obviously Yom Yerushalayim, which is the day that Jerusalem was unified. Uh, for 2,000 years, certainly, the Jews around the world proclaim next year in Jerusalem. And today on the Hebrew calendar, we mark the 53rd year that that dream finally became a reality. What I'd like to start off with, if we can, is if you can share the mood and situation in Jerusalem today versus what it was like in May, 1967. A short, a oh. short question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strange moment uh, in Israel today because we are emerging uh, from crisis. There's this tremendous feeling of relief. Uh, in that sense, I would compare the mood in Jerusalem today more to June 1967, uh, when we felt this great sense of reprieve. And by we, I mean Jews all around the world. I was a, a boy in Brooklyn uh, in those years. Uh, but uh, there really was this sense uh, of reprieve from a threat of, of a destruction. And, and there is something similar uh, to that feeling today. We've, uh, we've, we've escaped uh, the, uh, the evil decree. And there really is a feeling of today is Jerusalem Reunification Day in, in, in all kinds of metaphorical ways. So you've written uh, both in your book and in multiple articles about the untold story of the capture of Jerusalem. And there is such a fascinating story behind it that I think most people are quite unfamiliar with. And perhaps you can share with us a little bit about what really was happening before Jerusalem came back into Israeli hands. Can you share a little well, bit of that? So first of all, bear in mind that between uh, 1948, the founding of Israel, and 1967, the Six Day War, uh, Israel uh, was, uh, we had our capital city, Jerusalem, 
uh, divided between Jordanian and, and Israeli authority. There was literally a wall cutting through the city. And Jerusalem on both sides of the divide was a diminished city. Uh, it was a backwater uh, in the Kingdom of Jordan. It was not the capital city. Jordan never made it their capital. Amman was always the capital of Jordan. Uh, and Jerusalem, which was the capital city for Israel from, from the founding of this country, uh, nevertheless was a, a, a city that, that, that felt its, its, its severance in a way. It, it, it felt not only divided, but it was in some sense removed from the rest of the world. Jerusalem, up until 1966, had a single traffic light. It, was, it wasn't a city. It was nowhere near the thriving city that we know today. It was a backwater. And Jerusalem came alive when the wall that was cutting the city in half came down. June 7th, 1967, the city is united. And we were also reunited with the Western Wall, which we had been uh, deprived access of. Uh, from the founding of the state, contrary to Jordanian promises and international law to permit uh, Jewish pilgrims. And so there was this incredible sense of, of relief, first of all, that Israel had been saved from a war of intended destruction. Three Arab armies, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, all converged on our borders. And the rhetoric of those days, which I remember very well, was we're going to drive the Jews into the sea. And there was this terrible fear of, uh, God forbid, another Holocaust. And so the first emotion that Jews all around the world shared was a sense of reprieve. The second emotion was uh, joy when we realized the extent of the victory. Uh, and finally, we all experienced a sense of awe where we, when we vicariously stood with the paratroopers at the Western Wall on the morning of June 7th, uh, Jerusalem Day. And so that, that's something of, I would say, the inner emotional trajectory that really describes the time. It's hard to believe, as you said, anyone who has visited Israel, no matter their religion, no matter their background, no matter their ideology. I think that it's so important the way that you just described what was, because anyone who has been here within the past number of years, including with the light train that is changing the facade of Israel and moving us far into the next century, really would, would have a hard time believing that that is what the reality was just 53 years ago. So. I mean, this Jerusalem really is, as, as you know, Jerusalem is, is a world city again. Mm -hmm. uh, people speak of Tel Aviv as Israel's cosmopolitan city. I think that's nonsense. I, mean, tell, I love Tel Aviv, but it is a provincial Israeli city. Jerusalem is our, is our opening to the world. It is where we meet the world. And, um, and you think about how all the religions have thrived in Jerusalem since 1967. And if, if I could tell you for a moment my favorite story of June 7, 1967. It's directly related to this question of, of making space for all faiths here. As soon as the paratroopers reached the Temple Mount, it was around 10.15 in the morning, and Motagur, the commander of the paratroopers, uh, broadcasts his, fa his famous message uh, the Temple Mount is in our hands, and Jews all around the world feel this, this sense of overwhelming emotion. For the first time in 2,000 years, the center point of, of Judaism, of, of Jewish religion, of Jewish national identity uh, is back in our hands. And one of the paratroopers, Arik Achmon, who is a major figure in my book, Like Dreamers, uh, asks uh, Mota, um, can I raise the Israeli flag over the Dome of the Rock? Dome of the Rock, Muslim holy place, the beautiful gold dome. And in the, in the passion of the moment, Mata says, go, go up. And he climbs up the dome 
and hoist an Israeli flag. Moshe Dayan, the Minister of Defense at the time, famous war hero, is watching events happening on the Temple Mount from an adjacent uh, position on, on Mount Scopus through his binoculars. And he sees the Israeli flag going up over an is the Islamic holy site. And he immediately radios Matagur, are you out of your mind? Do you want to incite the entire Muslim world against us? Take down the flag immediately. And so with a very heavy heart, Mata orders the flag to be removed. Now think of the restraint of that moment. This is the moment of, of the triumph, the military triumph of the Jewish people and a vindication of Judaism. For 2,000 years denied our holy places, for 2,000 years relegated to the status of wanderer, and suddenly we're back at, at, in a, at the heart of, of our story. And at that very moment of triumph, of vindication, we, we, we restrain ourselves and we, we, and we do what was certainly, certainly the wise thing to do. But also I feel spiritual, and I'm speaking now as a religious Jew who loves the Temple Mount, who reveres the Mount as, as our holiest space. Spiritually, that was a moment of profound religious restraint. We never, of course, got credit for that. I don't think that too many peoples in our place would have shown the same wisdom and generosity of spirit as the Israeli army did at its moment of victory. Nevertheless, I think that that moment is really worth noting. And it's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the moments that I celebrate with you. It's, it's an extraordinary story and, uh, you know, cooler heads certainly prevailed in that moment. Uh, and, um, and, and it brings me to a, a question that actually reflects news that happened today. Obviously, if you're ever bored with news in Israel, you just have to blink or wait a moment and the headlines will change, as we like to say. So here we are, we are celebrating Yom Yerushalayim or Jerusalem Day today, even though this took place June 7th, this is, we're celebrating it today because obviously in Israel we go by the Hebrew calendar, the lunar calendar, and therefore we're celebrating it today. So today, Jerusalem's mayor uh, made a statement, and I'll just give a little bit of background. As you mentioned, uh, Jerusalem was under Jordanian rule uh, for 19 years, and Jews did not have access to such holy sites as the Kotel, or as we say in the Western Wall. And that suddenly, as you just so beautifully described, Jews had access to be able to go pray to the holiest site in Judaism again. Uh, the, the, the importance of which cannot be underscored enough. And yet today, Jerusalem's mayor made a rather unfortunate statement in an interview that he did saying that reformed Jews cannot pray together at the Western Wall. Uh, you know, telling that, that he made this statement today on, your, on Yom Yerushalayim. So how do we bridge the chasm between Israeli orthodoxy and the politicians who are beholden to that ideology with Jews in the diaspora who do not necessarily subscribe to this view or this practice, who are mainly in North America. Well, look, first of all, the mayor's statement negates the essence of this day. It negates the, that emotional shared trajectory that I described a moment ago that united the Jewish people and that changed Jewish history. It, it, it reawakened Soviet Jewry. It was, it was that experience of, 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 shared, of shared emotional unity. That, that transformed three million Jews in the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it transformed American Jewry into the, into the self-confident, uh, politically active uh, community we know today. Uh, all of that is a result of the unity we experienced in June 1967. And so for the mayor of Jerusalem to choose this of all days, to emphasize one of the most painful wounds dividing Jews is, to my mind, a, a betrayal of, uh, of 
Jewish people, of Jewish unity, of Jerusalem. He's supposed to be representing, not just, not, he's, he's not, his job is not only to oversee the collection of garbage in Jerusalem, but also to represent the spirit of Jerusalem. And, and he has, he has there. Now, you ask about how we can bridge the chasm between uh, the, the non-Orthodox denominations in the diaspora and uh, the, the Orthodox rabbinate here. We can't. That, that chasm stands. But we can try to circumvent it and undermine the exaggerated uh, authority that the Orthodox rabbinate has come to hold on our religious life. And what I would urge diaspora Jews to do is that when you speak to Israelis, when you speak to, to, to the Israeli public, don't speak in the language of religious pluralism because Israelis don't really understand religious pluralism for a very simple reason. Most Israelis come from families that have origins in diaspora communities, whether in Eastern Europe or the Middle East, where there was no Jewish religious pluralism. You were either Orthodox or less Orthodox or secular. And so the concept of religious pluralism is, 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 is not embedded in Israeli consciousness. But if you speak to us in a language of Jewish peoplehood, and Jewish unity, if you explain to Israelis that denying the legitimacy of the religious expression of a majority of diaspora Jews is, 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 is undermining the, the ability of the Jewish people to function. Uh, it is, I would go so far as to call it an anti-Zionist move. Zionism is the ideology of Jewish peoplehood. That's my definition for Zionism today. Once the state has been established, the role of Zionism today is to strengthen Jewish peoplehood. When the state founded by Zionism hands the keys to official Judaism to one segment of the Jewish people and only one segment, and this happens to be the segment that is least committed to Jewish peoplehood, and I'm speaking specifically of the Orthodox, and that's a crime against Zionism. That's an anti-Zionist act. And so American Jewry, American Jewish leaders speak to us in the language of Zionism and of Jewish unity and peoplehood, and you will find much greater resonance in the Israeli public than when you speak in the language of Wally. Those are, those are wise words, um, and, and thank you for your comments. Uh, I'd like to shift to the Israeli political scene, um, if we can. So after 500... If, if, we, if we must. <laughs> this is a light topic. <laughs> uh, after 507 days, Israel finally has a new government. What is your assessment? Look, like, like almost all Israelis, I, I loathe this government. It is bloated. Uh, it is the largest government in our history. It's a kind of a caricature of a government in many ways. Netanyahu uh, handed out ministries uh, as, as though uh, he, was, he was distributing free toaster ovens. Uh, he, he divided ministries artificially in order to make sure that, that his, his uh, supporters in the party uh, were were all appeased. Um, look, I, I voted for the center. Uh, I, I vote, I, I'm, I'm such a passionate supporter of the center that I voted for them three, three times in the last year. We had three rounds of election. Uh, and so this is not a government that I hoped for. And the same is certainly true for Likud support, supporters. Nobody wanted this government. And yet, I'm grateful that the government exists. The reason for that is that the alternative would have been tempting political chaos. And it isn't only because of the corona emergency, which thankfully seems to be the ebbing now in Israel, but we were a, a few short weeks ago experiencing the worst crisis in democratic legitimacy uh, since the 1990s, since the assassination of Rabin. We had the worst ever uh, crisis of authority uh, between the Supreme Court and the Knesset, the parliament, the, the 
Speaker of the Parliament, uh, Likudnik, shut down the Parliament uh, because Likud did not know, because the Likud no longer had a majority there. Supreme Court ordered him to reopen Parliament. He simply ignored the order. We have never been in a crisis like that before. Uh, and, and then if you factor in the threat of a fourth round of elections, which would have been inevitable had this unity government uh, not come into existence, this unloved, ugly government, uh, we would have really found ourselves in a situation where many Israelis would have stopped believing in the durability of uh, the democratic system. It was a very dangerous moment. Uh, and it was really a crisis of democratic legitimacy. And so Benny Gantz, the leader of the center, uh, took a very courageous position, I think, in violating the promise that he made to his electorate for the last year and a half. I will never sit with Netanyahu. I will never sit in a government uh, with a prime minister who is under indictment for charges of corruption. Netanyahu is going on trial on Sunday, the first sitting prime minister in the country's history. Netanyahu is inciting actively against the judiciary. He's trying to undermine the authority and the self-confidence, the trust of Israelis in our legal system. It is a scandal. Uh, I know it's hard for Americans to imagine what that must be like to have a president who would challenge the authority and legitimacy of your democratic institutions. But that is the situation that we at least here are currently experiencing. Uh, and so when Gantz joined the government, he demanded, first of all, the keys to the justice ministry, which is what Blue and White received. So the first major achievement of Blue and White was to retrieve the justice ministry from uh, the hands of those who who saw their job as undermining uh, the rule of law rather than upholding it. So for that alone, I'm grateful to Benny Gantz. And I think that what he succeeded in doing in creating this government is restore a semblance of, of confidence uh, in the basic functionality of our democratic institutions, even though, again, this government in many ways is a caricature of what a, a responsible government should look like. Um, so I'll just mention that AJC is a 501c3 uh, nonpartisan organization, and we work with all Israeli governments. So um, these, are, these are important words, um, but also that AJC really does work with all uh, governments. Um, I, I want to go to another topic that the Israeli government, current Israeli government, is dealing with uh, which is dominating the headlines right now, which is in the Israeli and international debate over the prospective annexation or extension of sovereignty of up to 30% of the West Bank and the complications that that could pose for the ultimate creation of a viable Palestinian state. Uh, what do you think Israel should do to deal with its immediate neighbors if the already distant prospect of two states becomes even more distant? So, I'll, I'll preface my answer by saying that, that my sense is that no matter who would be in government on our side, peace would not be possible anytime soon because we don't have a credible partner on the Palestinian side. And I say that with a great deal of pain because I, I believe deeply in the need for a two-state solution for Israel's sake. Never mind for a moment the Palestinians. We need to extricate ourselves from ruling over another people for reasons ranging from demographics to morality to our standing in the international community. Uh, for all those reasons and more, our relations with the diaspora, uh, we need a two state solution. It is nowhere near happening. At the same time, that doesn't absolve us from the need to keep working toward an eventual possible two-state solution and to make sure that we don't create the conditions that would foreclose that, that, that option. 
uh, annexing any part of the territories, in my mind, uh, would do precisely that. It would foreclose the, uh, or at least make the possibility of a two-state solution that much more unlikely. Um, it will have another uh, disastrous impact on our relationship with the Arab world. And as we know in the last few years, and you in AJC know this very well, there has been a, an extraordinary shift, an historic shift in, in the attitudes toward parts of the Sunni Arab world toward Israel. We are no longer seen as the problem, but as part of the solution. And much of the Arab world is looking toward Israel for protection against an expansionist and imperial Iran, which already controls, in effect, four Arab countries, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, through proxies. And this has created unprecedented openings for us. And so why at this moment should we be risking the, the first tentative signs of goodwill that we're beginning to see in, uh, in the Arab world. Now, I understand the Trump administration has created a certain uh, condition that didn't exist before, and the Israeli right believes this is uh, a, a now or never moment. Uh, from my point of view, let's keep it now. So you, you, first of all, I'll mention that AJC uh, supports a direct negotiation of a two-state solution. So uh, your, your words are important, and certainly AJC has been involved at the highest levels in terms of fostering relationships with Israel's Arab neighbors, as you've just mentioned. Um, do you think, uh, you know, that, um, that the, the, the coexistence both with Israeli Arabs and Jews and Israelis and Palestinians that have actually been highlighted uh, through COVID-19 and the working together, uh, that, that that actually could produce the opportunity for long-term future cooperation? I would uh, draw a distinction between very positive developments internally within the state of Israel, um, between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis. We, the, the, the corona experience has brought Arab Israelis closer to the Israeli mainstream. Uh, Arab, uh, uh, Arab doctors are 20% of Israeli doctors. 25% of Israel's nurses are Arabs. And so the healthcare sector uh, in many ways is our most integrated uh, Arab Jewish uh, place of meeting. Uh, the most uh, intimate experiences between Arabs and Jews uh, in Israel happen in the maternity wards and the cancer wards, and now the corona wards. And there have been very powerful stories emerging in the Israeli media, powerful images, an Arab doctor bringing a Torah scroll into a corona ward, uh, an Arab and Jewish uh, team of medics praying together on the street. Uh, the Jewish medic in a prayer shawl, the Arab medic on a prayer rug. These images have gone viral in, uh, in Israeli social media in recent weeks. And as a result of that, we're seeing an unprecedented shift in identity among Arab Israelis. Uh, a poll was just taken about a week or so ago, uh, and uh, fully 77% of Arab Israelis say that they see their personal future intimately linked with the future of the state of Israel. Only 11% of Arab Israelis now identify themselves as Palestinian. And I think that's an all time low. So we're seeing that when Arab Israelis feel embraced by the Israeli mainstream, by Jewish citizens, their sense of Israeliness responds in fine. And that's the dynamic that I hope we're going to be able to nurture because this is really a precious moment for, for civic Israel. And it's interesting because, you know, Corona was our first non-security national emergency. Uh, it's the first national emergency that had nothing to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. And so 
in the civic emergency, it was the healthcare system that was best positioned to, to, to take advantage of, uh, of bringing the Arab minority closer into the mainstream. I, I, as somebody who's been very involved in uh, Arab Jewish uh, efforts over the years, uh, this for me is a thrilling moment as, as an Israeli citizen. But to answer your question, Lyra, about Palestinian-Israeli relations, that of course is much more complicated. Look, I'm sitting right now in my home in French Hill in Jerusalem, literally the last row of houses in Jerusalem. And I'm looking out onto the next hill. It's already, I'm looking out onto the West Bank. And separating me from my Palestinian neighbors is a wall. The security barrier that we built during the second intifada, the, the four years of suicide bombing. Now, I'm looking at my neighbors. I see their, at night, I look into their lights, the lights of their homes. I hear the Moezin, the call, the call to prayer. I'm seeing the lights of Ramadan, the festive lights, and yet I'm completely separated. And so I don't see any real evidence that Corona is bringing us closer. Um, and uh, it's a very painful reality that we live with. And I. In my own way, I, I, I'm involved in efforts to try to, to communicate with Palestinians, to try to bring Israelis and Palestinians uh, in some kind of conversation. Uh, it's, it's an uphill we can We can hope that this situation will change for the better. Um, which, amen. And actually, we should also mention that tomorrow is Tomorrow evening is the end of, of Ramadan, so we certainly want to wish all of our friends who observe Ramadan and Id Mubarak, uh, you know, and, and really wish for, for peace together. Um, you, you've mentioned your Palestinian neighbor, so maybe you can touch upon the book that you most recently wrote, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor. Did you anticipate that you would get any responses, and, and, and what happened? You know, I, um, I wrote a series of letters to an imaginary neighbor on the next hill. And the book really was born through insomnia. I would be up uh, late at night, three, four in the morning, sitting in my study here and looking out at, at the village across the way and having conversations in my head with my unknown neighbor about everything that I wish that Palestinians understood about us and everything that I wish we could hear about what their lives and their experiences are like. And one night I sat down and just began writing, Dear Neighbor. I'm writing longhand as if it were a real old fashioned letter. Uh, Dear Neighbor, I know nothing about you. I don't know your name, but I see the lights in your home. I hear the call to prayer. I feel that we are so intimate we can almost hear each other breathe. And I began writing a series of letters trying to explain who we are as a people, what our story is, why I'm neighbors with, with the next hill, why I'm here. And, and it occurred to me that in 100 years of conflict, no one on our side had ever addressed the Palestinians or more broadly, the Arab world, with our story. You know, we, we complain justifiably how Palestinian media systematically distorts our narrative, uh, claims we have no history, no roots in this land, claims the Holocaust never happened. And no one ever on our side ever thought, why don't we actually reach out and tell our story? So I wrote this book and published it simultaneously in English and Arabic on the same day, and put it online in Arabic for free downloading. And you ask what I, what I expected. I expected nothing, really nothing. I put it out, I announced this on my Facebook page. Uh, I, um, I set up a Facebook page in Arabic, and I invited people to read 
and respond. And I started getting emails. Uh, many of them were angry, some were hateful, a few were, were death threats, but some were long and thoughtful. People who actually sat and read the book deeply disagreed with much of it, with all of it, with some of it. But I started finding people with whom I felt I could have a conversation. People who would say to me, yes, I agree with your basic premise that the tragedy of this conflict is that this is a struggle between two indigenous peoples, but I disagree with you about the Nakba, I disagree with you about 1967, I disagree with you about everything. And my response was, if we can agree that we are two legitimate peoples fought in, a, in an existential conflict that we need to solve, then it doesn't matter what else we disagree with. That's a foundation for an agreement. And I was looking even for a, a, a handful of partners with whom to model that conversation. And I found those people. And the paperback edition of letters that came out recently can, has a new epilogue of 50 pages, letters from Palestinians to their Israeli neighbor. And many of these letters are very difficult for me to read, very painful. But as a body of work, I find, I find it extraordinary. And, and here were people, courageous people, willing to engage with an Israeli, willing to argue, but respectfully. And as a result of that, you know, I, I, I've, I've developed friendships on the other side. Uh, my neighbor now has a name, has many names. I've been to my neighbor's homes. My neighbors have been to my home. And I've done campus tours with several letter writers. And I made a film with one of them, a short film, 15 minute film. And all I was hoping to do was model what a respectful conversation over irreconcilable differences might sound like. And we will never agree. Our narratives will never converge. But it was also important for me to give Palestinians the last word in my book. And that's, a, that's counterintuitive to, to this political moment. You're not supposed to show generosity to your political opponent. You're supposed to destroy your opponent. That's true not only in, in this conflict, it's certainly true in political discourse in other parts of the world. And, um, and what I was hoping to do was model a different kind of political conversation where Palestinians and Israelis can, can, can deeply disagree, but in a spirit of generosity, of accommodating each other's narratives, of being willing to listen to each other's narratives, and then disagree. And the key to that kind of conversation is two things. One is to stand strongly, firmly in your narrative, to love your story, love your people's story, and at the same time be willing to reach out in empathy and listen to the counter story. And if you're able to hold those two positions, then I think you can really begin to model that kind of point. Mm. It's very powerful. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And, and I think you're right, this course is critical. Uh, so with that, I'd actually like to turn this over for some audience questions, because I know we have been receiving many, many questions from our listeners from both around the country and around the world through AJC. So we'll ask for some questions now. Thank you, Myron. Thank you, Yossi. Our first question comes from Patricia in Miami, who asks, for years, many predicted that moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem would bring about a wave of protests throughout the Middle East. That didn't happen. What are your thoughts on why this was and what lessons can we learn from it? It's a really good question. The, um, I, I, was, I, I celebrated the move of the embassy. Uh, I did not see it as provocative or as the deal breaker that opponents heard it, it would be, and of course it has not been. And I think that one of the reasons was that it was made clear uh, by the administration that 
this move does not foreclose future negotiations uh, over the, the status of the city. And the embassy is in West Jerusalem and it did not change the, the situation on the ground in any way. What it did do was end the anomaly, the absurdity of Israel being the uh, only country in the world uh, that didn't have the right to name its own capital city. And whatever the future of Jerusalem will be, I personally don't believe that it's going to be possible to redivide the city. Uh, I think it would destroy the city. Uh, that said, there is room for negotiations about some kind of symbolic Palestinian uh, presence, sovereign presence uh, in the city, uh, but that's different from redividing and sharing the city. Uh, so I think that there are ways of navigating this. If there, if there is an atmosphere uh, of uh, a willingness to solve the conflict, which again, uh, unfortunately, uh, does not exist. And I also should add, I don't absolve my own leadership from contributing to, to that uh, ill will that exists. Thank you. Our next question comes from Zach in Dallas. What steps do you think Israel should take in order to persuade the international community that they're doing everything possible to reach an agreement with Palestinians? One of the, you know, one, one of the things that I find painful about the last years of uh, Israeli policy is that we have ceded the high ground to some extent. And the last serious Israeli offer to the Palestinians was in 2009, uh, and it was then Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, uh, who offered basically a withdrawal to the 67 line, or the equivalent of the 67 line, to uh, Palestinian uh, leader Mahmoud Abbas, who simply walked away from the deal. And as I said earlier, I don't believe that even if the left-wing Israeli merits party uh, were in power today, we would reach a deal because the Palestinian leadership is not prepared to, to give up its demand for refugee return, for the return of descendants of refugees to the state of Israel, uh, Palestinian refugees from 48. And that is a deal breaker for any Israeli government, left, right. And uh, having said that, that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of continually probing the other side for possible openings. We should be placing an offer on the table. And you know, the Trump plan, uh, I, I, I see the Trump plan in a very complicated way. I see it, uh, first of all, as uh, more uh, of, a, of an interim, a suggestion for an interim agreement than as a final status agreement. I don't believe it's really a viable final status plan, uh, but I also see its value in being a wake-up call to the Palestinians First of all, the Palestinian leadership, time is not on your side. Every time you reject an offer, you walk away from the Olmert offer, the map gets smaller. This has been the pattern since 1937 when the first offer of partition was put on the table by the Peel Commission. The offer to the Palestinians then was 80% of the land. UN partition 1947, the offer became 45%. Uh, the Clinton proposals in December 2000 the offer was 22%, and now the Trump plan, the map has gotten smaller. And so there's a message here for the Palestinian leadership. That is that rejectionism creates a, 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 a dynamic in which, in which the potential map of a Palestinian state gradually shrinks. Now, the wake, there's also a wake-up call here for the Israeli right in the Trump plan, and that is that here you have the most pro-settler, pro-Israeli right administration in American history. And even this administration has produced a plan that calls for a Palestinian state in whatever truncated form. 
but that accepts the premise of a two-state solution. And the settlement movement heard that message loud and clear, and the settlement leadership just the other day issued a, 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 an outright uh, rejection of the Trump plan. And I think that we should pay attention to that settler rejection because there's something in what they're seeing in the plan that's worth noting and that's worth uh, upholding. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric in Brussels. As mentioned, Israel has developed strong relationships with several Arab nations. Do you think these relationships can develop further without an Israeli-Palestinian agreement? And do you think these developing ties also affect the way Palestinians see Israel? Good questions. I think that they can develop on a um, behind the scenes gradual approach, provided that we don't throw any, any, any wrenches into the works. And I'm speaking, of course, uh, about annexation. Uh, if the status quo prevails, relations will continue. If we try to initiate some positive steps toward, toward the Palestinians, economic moves, uh, moves to ease conditions in, in Palestinian life in the territories, then I think that will be uh, taken as, uh, as, as a signal for Arab countries to, to up the ante and, and increase the, the pace of, of this kind of quiet normalization. Uh, how that will impact on Palestinians is a very good question. Uh, my sense, maybe this is more a hope than a sense, is that a final status agreement uh, will be possible only with the active involvement of Arab countries. Israel and the Palestinian leadership left to our own devices will not come to an agreement. We know the ins and outs of the agreement. There are no surprises left. Uh, it's not going to happen. I don't believe it will happen in our generation. But if you factor in the Arab world, the Arab world bringing its resources, bringing its pressure to bear on the Palestinians, you know, there used to be the conventional wisdom in the international community used to be that Israel would have to be forced and pressured to the table. I think it's the opposite. I think the Arab world is going to have to pressure the Palestinian leadership to come to the table. And under those circumstances, the deal that I see, that I as an Israeli would, would support, would be normalization with the Arab world in exchange for a Palestinian state. And the reason for that is very simple. The truth is, the painful truth is, that the Palestinian national movement has nothing to offer the Israelis. All they can offer us are promises of making peace, which they may abide or, or, or they may violate. It's the Arab world that has the, the wherewithal to offer Israel concrete concessions, economic trade, um, political recognition that frankly the Palestinians don't have. And so the trade-off that I see emerging in the long term is normalization with the Arab world in exchange for a Palestinian state. Thank you. Our next question comes from Maya in Buenos Aires. What role can religion play in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how can we engage religious leaders around the world as a force for good? Well, thank you for that question. It's, it's a question that's very dear to my heart. And the book that I wrote, uh, the letters to my Palestinian neighbor, was written uh, from the perspective uh, of a religious Jew writing to a religious Muslim. And it is very much evoking that language, that sensibility of shared faith. And I've, I've long felt that the negotiations were, were missing a crucial religious input. This is the Middle East. You can't have a peace process without some legitimization, some religious imprimatur. And so the next time we go to the table, 
what I would like to see in addition to the diplomats sitting at that table are rabbis and imam, theologians. For that matter, I think we need psychologists and social workers and trauma experts because this is a conflict that is not ultimately about what people think. It's not about settlements and refugees and, and Jerusalem and holy places. It is about all those issues, but those are the consequences of the conflict. The underlying roots of this conflict are the intangible issues. Identity, the right to exist, trauma, history, memory. Those are the issues that really animate Palestinians and Israelis. And the diplomats lack the most basic tools to deal with. And so what I was trying to do in this book was create a shared religious language with my neighbor. And one of the most gratifying responses that I received uh, was from a young man named Yusuf Bashir, who grew up in Gaza and, and actually wrote a terrific book uh, called uh, uh, The Words of My Father. And he wrote a letter in response, which I published in the new edition, uh, where he writes that, that this was the first time reading my letters that he was able to hear the Zionist narrative because it was presented by a person of faith and it was, and it was spoken in a context of, of, of a shared sense of, of, of belief and of, and of love of God. And that for me was really an, a vindication. It was one of the most precious responses that I got. Thank you, really thank you for that question. Thank you, Yossi. And apologies to the rest of our viewers whose, whose questions we were not able to get to today, but I know we're running short on time. So Myra, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, Yossi, I think it's clear that um, the, the conversation today is much like your conversations with AJC Project Interchange Delegations, where there's never enough time uh, and that we could spend hours with you. And I think that, uh, you know, this conversation has really been a tour de force. We've explored so many important topics. And I know that every listener is privileged to have participated in this conversation with you. Um, Thank you. You know, Myra, I just, I would, with your permission, I would just like to say that uh, I actually began my career as an Israeli uh, analyst and uh, lecturer speaking to Project Interchange groups uh, going back to the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, that was my, 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 my first experience, and so I, I have a very uh, warm spot in my heart for, for this work. The, the feeling is mutual, <laughs> rest assured. Um, and, and I think that, you know, so thank you for that. And you are a, a, a dear friend to AJC. And, uh, you know, your voice is so unique as we have experienced throughout this conversation. And I think that your writing both educates us, but it inspires us to think beyond our limits. And that is truly a gift for which if I can speak on behalf of everyone to say thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to continued conversations. I, was, thank I you. as well, thank you. Thank you, Yossi, for joining AJC today in a fascinating conversation. And thank you, Myra. I also wanna thank our audience for joining us and showing your commitment to the topics discussed here today. In these unique times, while so many of us are separated from our family and friends, AJC is still bringing us together on the issues that matter. Please consider making a donation to AJC so we can offer you more programs like this one and so we can continue standing up for Israel here in America and around the world. Visit AJC.org slash donate. AJC will be observing Memorial Day on Monday, May 25th. Please join us for our next Advocacy Anywhere program on Tuesday, May 26th for a special evening conversation with His Excellency Yusuf Kala, former Vice President of Indonesia and current Chairman of the Indonesia Red Cross. The program will begin at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you.